I'd like to welcome you to the Midweek Bible Study of the Mount Carmel Church. I'm so glad that you're able to watch and to listen tonight. We're going to continue our study in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We've kind of went about it kind of slowly, but there's so much packed into verses 5 through verse 10 of chapter 1, and we'll be there tonight again as we look at this area of the importance of the gospel. And what we're looking at here is that the great example that the Thessalonica church did and, um, and had. And uh, it's a great story, a great, not only a story, but a, a challenge to each and every one of us as Christians uh, to what the gospel means to us, but how we re also react to it. But I want to just welcome you to our midweek Bible study. I'd just like to say thank you for coming or thank you for watching. We thank you for the technology that we have to be able to upload, and, and I pray that uh, you're spreading the word that for others to maybe possibly be part of our Bible study on Wednesday nights, or we also upload our morning worship service on Sundays, and we would love to have you come and to worship with us and be part of uh, our church family. If you don't have a church that you call home, we'd love to have you come and be part of the Mount Carmel Church. We're located... 3023 Clover Run Road, Mahaffey, Pennsylvania. Our phone number is 814-277-4435. My name is Pastor Brian. We'd love to have you come and be part of our church family. But let's have a word of prayer as we start our Bible study tonight, and I pray that this week has been one that God has blessed in so many ways, and I pray that this morning when you woke up, you said, Lord, thank you for another day of life. How can I serve you? But let's have a word of prayer tonight. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for, again, our time that we can spend in your word. Lord, we pray for all those watching and listening tonight. I also pray for those in our church building. Lord, as we have a night of uh, just a Bible study and a time together and in a time of prayer. But we thank you for all that you do. We thank you for the ability to be able to... Uh, have this service out and this Bible study out to others that may not be able to get out. And Lord, we just ask for your continued guidance in all of our lives. We thank you for um, everything that you have done for us. I pray, Lord, for tonight for open hearts for what you would have for us as we look at the importance of the gospel, the importance of a, uh, just what that means to us. And as the church of Thessalonica was willing to to share and to reach out into uh, the, the area that they lived in. And actually it spread further than that. But we just thank you for that. We ask for your guidance in our lives. We pray for our study tonight. I pray for parents and, and guardians and grandparents and those that have children in school because school will soon be over. We pray also for the young adults that are already home from college. Lord, that you would guide there. I also think of those that have went through uh, surgeries and different things in their life, Lord. We pray for them. We ask for your guidance there. I know of a gentleman in our church, Lord, that's just had surgery. You know who he is. And Lord, I just pray for continued healing for him. But Lord, we also pray for those that are maybe running through health issues. And Lord, we pray that they look to you. And, and Lord, we also think of those that uh, may have an unspoken request or something else, Lord, that that is just stirring in their heart and their mind, Lord. We just ask for your guidance and direction in each and every part of their lives. We thank you for today. We thank you for our time together. And we praise you for who you are and who you can be in our lives. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we want to continue our study of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter five, 1, chapter, or verses 5 through 10 the importance of the gospel. And we're looking at this whole study of the book of 1 Thessalonians, talking about this area in our lives in the meantime. You know, what should our Christian lives look like and what should we be doing as we wait for uh, Christ's return? You know, he's going to return someday, and if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, he's coming back to take us home with him. But as we, we look at this, I, I want us to look at verses 5 through 10 again. So, if you'd follow along, as I read down through, we're going to have a little bit of review, very quick review, so be ready, be quick on that, but, uh, verses 5 through verse 10. 
For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, but with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. You know, we want to do just a little bit of review of what we've already seen. Well, in verse 5, we see the authority of the gospel. We see the presentation where it says in verse 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only. So in other words, it, what he's pointing out to them at the church in Thessalonica is just the authority of the gospel and, and the presentation, how that it's not only word, but it's in action. We saw the power of it, not come to you in word only, but also in power. We also looked at the person and in the Holy Spirit. We saw the persuasion and in much assurance. There was much assurance. This is truth. This is what God's word is saying. It is truth. And then we saw the preparation in the last part of verse 5 where it says, As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Then we also looked in verses 6 and 7 at the acceptance of the gospel. You know, the gospel being accepted. Well, in verse 6, in the verse part of it, it says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord. Their conversion, they, they were studying and, and praying to idols and everything, but we see in this verse where Paul is talking about they became followers of us and of the Lord. They believed. They, they believed in who Christ was. We see in the second part of verse 6, their commitment, having received the word in much affliction. You know, they, they received it and there was much going on in their lives. There was much affliction, much, much ridicule. But they were still committed to stand firm for what they knew to be true, the gospel. We see their consolation, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Spirit. Despite everything that was going around beside them, they still had joy. They had that joy that, that only Christ can give. Then in verse 7, we see their communication. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. So we see that they, they didn't just keep it to themselves. They spread the gospel. They shared the gospel. Well, then we also saw the advancement of the gospel in verse 8. You know, the gospel was, was advanced through the efforts at Thessalonica. Notice in verse 8, the first part of it, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. They were willing to share it. You know, that, that's a great challenge to us, isn't it? To be willing to share the gospel with others. Not only take it in like the Thessalonican church did, but be willing to spread the gospel. Because in the next part of verse 8, it said, you know, we look at, it was spread. Because it says, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. You know, and look at that, and we often read that, and I know I, I brought this up last week, but Macedonia and Achaia was actually the splitting of Greece in half. So it's the whole area, the whole country of Greece that the word was spread to. A large area, but it was by their example and their love for Christ. We also see that it was sufficient in verse 8. 
where it says, Your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. In other words, it has went out. It, it's sufficient. It has went out. The last part of that, your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. They had that strong a belief, that strong of ministry, the people that heard it, saw it, listened to it, understood it because of their relationship with Christ. Their actions. It wasn't only head knowledge, but it was action. Well, tonight, we want to finish this study up as we look down through it. We want to start with verse 9, where we see the assurance of the gospel. You know, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You know, look at that, that verse 9. Serve. Serve the living and true God. You know, first I want us to see the testimony in verse 9, the very first part of it. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. You know, Paul was, what we're seeing here is Paul was amazed at what he had saw and heard. It seemed as if everywhere he went, he was hearing of the church of Thessalonica, how the church was doing this and how the church was doing that and how the church was spreading the gospel. It was so evident that he didn't even have to take his time to share what the Lord had done for them. Because people already knew what the Lord had done. You know, word had spread that God was working wonders and through the church there. You know, I, I know as Christians we're not to have envy in our lives over something that someone else has. But the church at Thessalonica had something very special going on. It was willing to share, it was willing to not only take in the knowledge, but live out the knowledge. And other people knew that. You know, it wasn't for their glory, but it glorified the God they served. Because their lives and their testimony had so impacted the world that people everywhere knew of their faith. It wasn't just this, something that, well, I think this church knows this, or I think those people know this. It was... They know that and listen to them and listen to how they stand. God was using them in a great way. Now that's something as a pastor of a church, that's something that really all of us should desire in our hearts. You know, our testimony is one of the most important things that we have. Wouldn't it be wonderful for us to be recognized in our community and even in the county that we live in as a place, as a, a church where God is honored, and that all of us as Christians within that church are faithful, and our lives are being changed daily, it's because it's a lifelong process, isn't it? To become Christ-like and to draw closer to Him. You know, many churches, if you think about them, have a reputation but that reputation isn't always a good reputation, is it? You know, you can probably think if you close your eyes or just think for a minute, well, I can remember that church, it's noted for that. Or I can remember that church, it's noted for that. But the, Czech, the Thessalonian church was noted for their gospel and the truth. You know, I want us to have a godly reputation. I want us to be a place that our church family can be proud to be a part of. I want our church family to, to be able to say, well, that's the Mount Carmel church. We believe in God's word, and that's the truth. And stand on it. We also see in our passage here the triumph in verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They had a triumph. You know, Paul was well aware of the reason for their great influence and their testimony. And those who knew about Thessalonica knew of the idolatry and the immorality 
that was prevalent there. So this stood as a powerful testimony to the grace and power of God. This Sunday we're going to be looking at a what it means to have a grace-filled heart. But that word grace, they had a powerful testimony to, to those around them of the grace and power of God in their lives. You know, he had delivered them from a life of idolatry to a life of worship offered to the true and living God. You know, the Lord had taken people that were caught up in the world with no chance of any joy and peace that only He can give and transformed their lives with His glory. You know, that's such an important lesson for us to learn today because nothing, and let me say that again, nothing is impossible with God. Just think about what he has done in, in your life. Think what he has done in my life. You know, we often doubt that God can do certain things. And even, and even at times, think, well, he couldn't save that person. Or he couldn't change that person's life. But we serve the one who can save anyone. We serve the one that not only can save anyone, but do anything. You want to know something? We just need to be faithful to share the gospel and leave the work of the conviction and conversion to Him. We need to plant that seed and allow the Holy Spirit to, to water and to nurture that seed. The other thing that we see is the anticipation of the gospel in verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Paul knew what they had received. He knew that they had accepted Christ as their Savior. They had received more than they completely understood. You know, we too can claim these glorious promises. You know, first in the first part of verse 10, we see the expectation those who had received Christ were instructed to wait for the Son from heaven. They could anticipate His return because we know that that promise is going to happen. You know, Jesus left us with the promise that He would come again. And He has gone away to prepare a home in heaven for all the redeemed. And He will come again and receive us unto Himself. And where He is, we may be also. You know, we ought to live lives each day in anticipation and full expectation of our Lord's return. He's coming again, just as He said. And this could be the day of His return. We don't know. This could be the next minute of His return. He could come. He could come tomorrow. He could come tonight. Are we living our lives as if He's coming today? Are we living our lives as if He's coming right now? We also see the resurrection. Paul reminded them that Christ had risen from the dead and he was no longer in the tomb, but alive forever. They had hope and assurance because Jesus rose again. You know, that is where our hope lies as well. If you think about it, had there been no resurrection, we would have no hope in life beyond the grave. And because Jesus lives, those who have accepted Jesus as their Savior have the promise of eternal life. He overcame death and the grave, and we are assured of the resurrection in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, listen to this verse. It says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 52 through 55 say this, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, 
Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? We also see the justification. Paul reminds them of their justification in Christ. You know, the Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. When sin is finished, it brings forth death. But eternal death and judgment is the punishment of sin. But God is holy and cannot condone or have fellowship with sin. There had to be a sacrifice that could forever atone for man's sin. Where did that take place? Well, Christ provided that sacrifice in his own body upon the cross. So all who come to Christ in their salvation are forgiven of their sin. Their account is wiped clean. The account is paid in full. You know, we no longer stand accountable for our sin. When God views the redeemed, he only sees the righteousness of his only begotten Son. We have been justified and delivered in him. You know, these first five verses here in chapter 1 have given a powerful, but I, I hope an encouraging and challenging study that we've looked at over the past three weeks. And I rejoice for the hope and forgiveness the, that the saved have in Christ. You know, I have hope and assurance for the future in Him. Something for us all to think about tonight. How does Christ view our effort and our labor for Him? Are we doing all we could for His glory? Are we recognized for our commitment? The church at Thessalonica was a good example through these verses that we see, and Paul is commending them for what they did and have done because they spread the gospel and they saw the importance of the gospel. How does Christ view our commitment to him? Are we doing all we can for his glory? Are we recognized for our commitment in the area that we live in, our families? That's a challenge to us. But please know that he is with us each and every step of the way. And when we become a follower of His, a Christian, a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit lives within us and is always with us. I pray as we've looked at the importance of the gospel, that the gospel is important to you and know that that is truth. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear me, Father, we thank you for today. I thank you for our time together in your word. And Lord, we just ask for your guidance tonight as we look at this area of the importance of the gospel in our lives. The gospel was important to the Thessalonian church. And as we see an example here, Lord, of people living godly lives, that should put a light in our fire, a spark in our fire, a, a flame to our fire, that we can also have the same faithfulness, the same love, the same concern for others as the Thessalonian church did. Lord, help us in our, our walk with you individually to walk in a way that is pleasing to you. Help us as a church, the Mount Carmel church, Lord, or whatever church people may be attending that they're viewing tonight, to walk in, in your grace and glory, to show others, to be known for that, Lord, I pray that we stand firm on your word. And Lord, as this world tries to tear us apart, tear the church apart, tear your word apart, Lord, help us not to waver. Help us to stand firm. Help us to have grace for others and love for others. We thank and praise you for tonight. We thank you for our study together. We thank you for these verses that we've looked over the last three weeks. Uh, that we see the importance the church had that the church had for the gospel. We thank and praise you for all that we are, all that you are and can be in our lives. 
We thank you for all that you do, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you for watching and listening tonight. I pray that this study that we're starting in 1 Thessalonians and had this kind of slow down time of looking at these five verses over the last week of the importance of the gospel, that we can truly see the importance of the gospel and how that it can be lived out through our lives to others. Thank you for watching and listening tonight, and may God bless.